On this Friday night was the bus crash on Alberta's Columbia Ice Fields, an accident waiting to happen. It's really, really scary. As the company defends its record, two former employees allege alarming safety issues. There's like a constant problem that just doesn't get fixed. The young and the reckless. Call out your friends if they're not feeling well. Targeting the messaging to those who are ignoring public health rules. More complaints about the Governor General, the former employee backing up claims of a toxic work culture, and keeping the Olympic dream alive. I'm grateful to be in the position that I'm in. Canadian athletes practice patience during the pandemic. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The full analysis of what happened to that tourist bus on the Columbia Ice Fields in Alberta, the one that rolled down a steep embankment, killing three people and injuring 24 others, won't be complete for months. But Global News has spoken to former drivers of the specially designed Ice Explorer buses, and they say potential safety issues like leaking coolant and oil were routinely flagged by drivers and then ignored. Global News has agreed to conceal their identities because their concerns speaking out could affect their careers. Jamie Dahl reports. I just could picture just how scary it would have been, um, not only for the driver, but for the passengers. He sat in the driver's seat of a pursued ice explorer for an entire season, shuttling tourists through the ever-changing landscape of the Columbia ice field was his very first job as a professional driver. Last weekend's deadly crash there, a disaster he says he long feared would become a reality. It's really, really scary. And, um, you know, it happened to me that I went down the moraine out of control once, and that was really scary, and I could feel, you know, my adrenaline pump. And when I heard about what happened... He says in that case, his transmission lockup failed going down a steep hill, but he managed to keep it from going off course. There was one day, I think, where I had three different buses I put into because the bus I was in kept breaking up. Yeah, so um, mechanical issues happened, like, all the time. There was one point where... I had a bus just shut off uh, just as I was get, about to get to the turnaround point where people were going to walk around. The former Icefields driver alleges the buses were notorious for leaking coolant and engine oil and overheating. He says emergency windows often didn't open. And while drivers were required to do daily inspection reports, he claims maintenance wasn't a top priority. He's not the only former driver raising concerns. This woman says the bus she was driving skidded backwards with a full bus load because there was just not enough tread on the tires. There was like a constant like problem that just doesn't get fixed by mechanics, whether it's there's not enough mechanics or whatever. It's like there's just so many incidences that were just close calls and it's, I don't know, it's, 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 it's horrible. It's horrible. She had come from Australia and admits she had never even driven on an icy highway before getting behind the wheel of an ice explorer. I did feel like we were trained quite well uh, as being a driver to the extent if everything is sunny. Do you know what I mean? Like if everything is going A-OK, then yeah, you are equipped to be a driver and to do like a good tour and have all the joke. But if things went bad, she says she didn't feel experienced enough to know what to do. Global News contacted Pursuit, the company who now manages these buses. Pursuit did not answer questions about the specific allegations, but said in a statement, We stand by our 39 years of operation, where we have safely guided over 16 million passengers across the terrain and pride ourselves on our commitment to training and passenger safety and our strong track record of safety. The RCMP, Transportation Safety Board and Parks Canada are investigating. Jamie Daw, Global News, Banff, Alberta. The identity of another victim from that crash is now confirmed. A family friend identified Griva Patel, a nursing graduate from India, as one of the three victims killed in the crash and supplied these photos to Global News. She had been in Canada for a year and a half and her friend says she was hoping to begin a new life here. As people slowly start to fly again, there's a new warning tonight about one of the most popular passenger planes. U.S. federal safety regulators have issued an emergency airworthiness directive for thousands of Boeing 737s that have been parked during the pandemic. FAA inspectors found problems with air check valves that could lead to dual engine failure in flight. 
The Federal Aviation Administration is ordering all operators of Boeing 737s to inspect engine valves in jets that have been sitting idle for more than a week. Inspectors found corrosion in the valves of planes being taken out of storage. The FAA took the action after four recent reports of single-engine shutdowns due to check valves being stuck open. Transport Canada says the same inspections will be done on 205 of the Canadian aircraft. This has nothing to do with the Boeing 737 MAX, which has been grounded since March 2019 after two fatal crashes. There's a warning tonight from Canada's chief public health officer. Dr. Theresa Tam says not only is Canada's COVID-19 curve headed in the wrong direction, a growing number of younger people are getting sick. In the last week, more than 60% of newly reported cases were people under the age of 39, and nearly a third of them had to be hospitalized. I must urge all Canadians, particularly younger adults, to not give in to COVID-19 fatigue. This is your generation and your future that is being shaped. Keeping track of who has been exposed is key to limiting the spread. And today, after weeks of delays, a new smartphone contact tracing app is finally in beta testing. It's designed to warn users if they've been in close contact with someone who tested positive for COVID-19. You can sign up to help test the app through the Canadian Digital Service. As Heather Yurks west explains, getting young people to listen, not just about that app, but to all the messaging about public health restrictions, is a big hurdle. It's a plea being echoed across the country. This needs to be a wake-up call. What more can I say? I, you know, be responsible. Call out your friends if they're not feeling well. After months under lockdown, young people are hitting the town at bars, restaurants, parties and gyms and COVID-19 infections are on the rise. We've seen the number of uh, contacts that each individual case has go from where it was about six a few months ago to more like 15 now. So there's an, a larger number of people that uh, individuals are coming into contact with. For contact tracers, that's a challenge, especially in situations where people don't know who they've come into contact with. In Alberta, where active cases have more than doubled in just a few weeks, hospitals are feeling the strain. And it's not just older adults needing care. Our current acute care utilization is approaching the highest number of admissions on any single day that we have had. We're seeing cases in younger in younger patients, younger populations now. We're seeing mainly the 20 to 29 and you know 30 to 39 um, age groups. So which is not, not surprising with people getting out and doing more. It's why several provinces are now looking at ways to try and turn things around. Since March, the B.C. government has been partnering with the Vancouver Canucks to target its messaging to young people through social media. The province says it plans to start enlisting the help of other social media influencers soon, too. We can gather, we can chill, just no hugs or kisses. Two meters apart, we can still talk and listen. And in Quebec, ads featuring rapper Zach Zoya began airing this week. Alberta says it's working on a new strategy to target young people as well. The hope is that better communication will start changing habits before public health officials are forced to start shutting things down a second time. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. Older people are hit hardest by COVID-19, but no one should think they're immune. Coming up, the story of a 30-year-old Toronto man who spent eight weeks on a ventilator and he has a message for younger Canadians. In the United States, there are now so many COVID-19 hotspots that a top White House advisor is urging all Americans to wear masks because the terrible outbreak in New York in late March is now being repeated elsewhere. And I just want to make it clear to the American public, what we have right now are essentially three New Yorks with these three major states. She is referring to Florida, California and Texas, where more than 500 people died yesterday alone. As case numbers surge, more and more hospitals are overwhelmed. Jackson Prosco has the latest from Washington. There are now more people hospitalized with COVID-19 in the U.S. than at any other time. State after state is setting daily records for the number of deaths. In Starr County, Texas, where the local hospital is running at 300% capacity, patients who are most likely to succumb to the virus will now be sent home to die. We are not gods. We are not anybody to take a decision of who should live or who should die. 
Across the U.S., the rapid growth in new cases has been driven largely by young people. Experts warn that won't last. In a few weeks, maybe a month or so, increased infections in older people will be seen. A worrying trend as the White House pushes schools to reopen. The children obviously have a very strong immune system. Despite all the unknowns about how children are impacted and how that might put their parents or teachers at risk. We certainly know from other studies that children under 10 do get infected. It's just unclear how rapidly they spread the virus. With so many hotspots and cases on the rise in most of the U.S., President Donald Trump has recently been forced to bend to the reality of the pandemic. He canceled the Republican convention in Florida, where he was set to accept his party's nomination in August. While places that have already beat back the virus once fear the threat of a resurgence, Washington, D.C. and Massachusetts have joined New York in ordering anyone coming from nearly 30 hard-hit states to quarantine for two weeks. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Back in this country, Governor General Julie Payette says she supports an investigation into allegations of workplace harassment made against her. The Privy Council Office, which coordinates and supports all departments and agencies of the federal government, will conduct the probe. In a statement, Payette says, I take harassment and workplace issues very seriously, and I am in full agreement and welcome an independent review. Mike Lucature on what we know about the complaints and what happens next. All is quiet at the residence of the Governor General, a stark contrast to what some former employees have described as a toxic atmosphere inside Rideau Hall. The vibe, the, you know, the, the stress, the constant barrage, the, uh, it was just, it was unbearable. One former employee agreed to speak with us on the condition they remained anonymous, but their experience echoes reports of alleged abusive treatment by both Governor General Julie Payette and her secretary, Asunta Di Lorenzo, who also happens to be Payette's longtime friend. When they were together in meetings, they would gang up together. Uh, they would uh, they would barrage people. The former employee says they'd see someone leave Di Lorenzo's office crying at least once a week. The Privy Council office says it will conduct a thorough, independent, and impartial review to examine the concerns raised by past and current employees of the office of the secretary to the governor general. In a statement, Payette welcomed the review, saying she is deeply concerned with the media reports. But former staffers said the complaint process is a closed loop. It's hard to be objective, and it's hard for other employees to think that they're going to be treated fairly if they have a if they have a conflict with. In this case, your best friend. So, should Payette step down? Well, that's a decision for the Prime Minister to make, if he so wishes. It won't be a Donald Trump-style tweet saying you're fired, right? It, it, it will be a, a discreet conversation between uh, the Prime Minister and, uh, and the Governor-General, um, if it came down to it. Now, despite multiple people coming forward publicly to complain, a spokesperson for the Governor General says there have been no formal complaints regarding harassment at Rideau Hall. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. Canadians reflect on the extent of systemic racism. Coming up, a new poll showing how attitudes have evolved. Twenty twenty has so far been a tumultuous year around the world. The pandemic, combined with the calls for racial justice, have led to lots of reevaluation of our society and our attitudes. And now a new Ipsos poll done exclusively for Global News shows Canadian attitudes on racism have shifted. Sixty percent of Canadians surveyed said they feel racism is a serious problem in this country. That's up thirteen points over last year. Mike Drolet takes a deeper look at what the poll reveals about systemic racism. It had to be big to push COVID-19 out of the headlines. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! A resounding call for societal change proved to be just that. Are we going to keep going down this route or are we going to come up with some innovative, humane, kind, compassionate ways of being with each other? and with the earth. In an exclusive Ipsos poll conducted for Global News, it appears Canadians are ready to listen. 
In fact, 63% say they support the Black Lives Matter protests. Whatever the reason, the message of equality seems to be getting through, even as the number of Canadians who say they've experienced racism firsthand continues to rise. Having, you know, lived with uh, racism for 65 years, um, I, I have a lot of hope when I hear that. It didn't happen overnight, and so it's not going to go away overnight. In fact, the Ipsos poll found that 17% of Canadians are unsure what they believe and that they can't say they're not racist. What they are sure about is everybody else. 54% believe everyone is a little racist. And that belief system is an important element. Dexter Voisin, who wrote America the Beautiful and Violent, says racism is deeply ingrained in our psyches, whether we know it or not. For those that do, they certainly seemed ashamed. 49% say they think racist thoughts, but they'd never talk about them in public. The very, sometimes the very denial of racism allows racism to continue. So very often I've had conversations with well-educated colleagues and they'll say, yeah, racism exists, but not in our organization. So folks are apt to see racism in other spaces, but then we have blind spots when it comes to how we contribute to a system of racism. But he too is hopeful change is on the horizon. The groundswell is too deep and vast to ignore anymore. Mike Lake, Global News, Toronto. Turning 30 with COVID-19 ahead a young survivor's warning and his long road to recovery. It's been said time and time again that most people who get very sick with COVID-19 and most people who die are over the age of 60, but that does not mean younger people are immune. They get infected too and can not only pass it on to older people, they can get so sick they end up in intensive care. Tonight, Karen Lieberman has the cautionary tale of a 30-year-old who thought he'd be just fine. It's been nearly three months since Delroy Noble walked into this Toronto area hospital after testing positive for COVID-19. I remember waking up and I was unable to breathe. It was like very, very difficult. He left his job at Pearson International Airport in April with cold symptoms. When he spiked a fever, he suspected it could be the novel coronavirus. I believe I got my mother sick, my aunt sick, and my younger brother sick because they all tested positive as well. Delroy went to the emergency department and within two days his condition worsened. There was a consult to the critical care team uh, and ended up in the ICU, was intubated. Ontario is seeing a spike in cases of COVID-19 in the 20 to 39 age group. Delroy marked his 30th birthday here in hospital on a ventilator. The general population that comes in with COVID is usually older. He's one of the younger ones. For 59 days, Delroy was hooked up to a ventilator. The medical team was hopeful but uncertain of his future. I think uh, given his age that he did uh, come to us with uh, less comorbidities. Some of our older coronavirus patients did come with hypertension, diabetes, uh, cardiac risk factors as well. When the breathing tube was removed and Delroy opened his eyes, his sister was there to greet him. I remember her telling me it's June 30th. It's like you were in a coma for two months. Besides feeling weak and unable to walk, Delroy felt lighter. He lost a lot of weight. Roughly. 130 pounds. Might have gained back a few though because the food here is pretty good. <laughs> he hasn't lost his sense of humor, but Delroy does have a serious message for other young adults. Don't take this for a joke because personally when the pandemic first started, I thought that, hey, I'm a young man. If I get it, I'm just going to get a cold. When I fell unconscious that day on May 5th, for all we know, you, I, I could have died that day. Karen Lieberman, Global News, Toronto. Next, final countdown planning for Tokyo 2021. How is Team Canada coping? Oh my. Oh. Well, it's pretty clear Dr. Anthony Fauci is in the right profession. Even he admits that pitch was a little off the mark. America's top infectious disease doctor got the honor of throwing the first pitch last night to kick off the baseball season. And after being told they can't play in Toronto because of COVID-19 concerns, the Toronto Blue Jays now say they'll play the majority of their home games in Buffalo, New York. 
The pandemic has put a wrench into many sports plans. The Olympic Games were supposed to start in Tokyo this week. Instead, the countdown is now on for next summer, as Crystal Gamansing explains. It's the last weekend in July. Many of us have lost track of the days, but not Olympic-bound athletes like Dana Pedereski. I'm grateful to be in the position that I'm in where I know I have a spot. Um, and at the same time, I sort of am viewing this delay as just another year to get stronger. If it wasn't for the pandemic, venues for the summer games would be packed. Instead, we are now one year out and the countdown is on. And the Olympic Games are the most complex event on this planet. Uh, we have to get together 11,000 athletes. But some people don't want the games to go ahead. Part of the issue is cost. With the postponement, conservative estimates peg the cost of the games at around $15 billion. There's also doubt they can be held safely given the continued spread of COVID-19. You train for four years, eight years, 12 years. You commit everything you have. Uh, with the hope to compete, with the hope to win. Three-time Olympic gold medalist Marnie McBean knows all about the roller coaster of emotions. The chef de mission tried to reflect that in her latest letter to the athletes. Our plans were garbaged in, in March, um, but our goals weren't. Our goals remain the same. The only thing I can do is focus on what I can control, and that's working hard and trying to be the best athlete that I can be. And that means staying healthy and training where and whenever it's possible. Crystal Gamance in Global News, London. And that is Global National for this Friday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is London, Ontario, just north of Lake Erie. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next week. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.